We're just returning from our executive session, so returning back to public session at uh, 6.02. Uh, in response to Governor Baker's declaration of a public health emergency and the related emergency executive order dated March 12, 2020, the Tennessee Institute of Public Meetings shall meet remotely until further notice. This meeting will be recorded and posted following the meeting. Public comment will be available via Zoom. Note the chat feature has been turned off. Also, we've had some technical difficulties, so this will not be live streamed on Facebook today. We apologize for that. We'll work, work through that for the future. Um, you may also email me at pgates at sit.org um, with questions. Um, again, uh, the school committee, uh, four of the members here, we're trying a new venue. We are at the uh, lovely Situate Center for Performing Arts. Uh, we're trying to utilize this space uh, and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, when we can go back to in-person meetings, we may be able to utilize this as well to allow for um, a greater number of participants than we have in the past. Um, so hopefully you enjoy the views behind us. Um, a little bit different from what you've seen in the past, but we're not at home. We are at the Center for Performing Arts. Um, with that being said, I'm gonna jump right into the agenda. We're gonna go right to the student report. Uh, Ms. Rosie Tertia, if you could just raise your hand, I can un ask you to unmute. Oh, I can't see it. <laughs> Sorry, my computer is not 100% right now. Um, That's okay. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Um, so I'll be giving the student report tonight um, as was requested of me, um, but going forward, I'm not sure I... Oh. You guys lose her too? Yeah. Rosie, we lost you. Rosie? Rosie? Uh, oh boy. Sorry? Rosie? We, yeah. uh, we couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Is it? Yeah, we can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yep. Okay, sorry. Um, should I just start from the beginning? Did you hear any? Yeah, nope. Okay. <laughs> um, so just someone like wave if you can and I'll try to. Um, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so I was just saying for this week, I'll be reading the student report, report as was requested of me, but um, going forward, I'm not sure this position was what I understood it to be, uh, and I'm not sure I'm the best fit for it, so I'm going to reconsider my role, um, but for this week, I'll read the report. So um, just touching on what we talked about last week, um, there was discussion about student participation um, and anti-racism efforts. So um, in the past couple of weeks, students have participated in the Black Lives Matter Situate March. Um, a petition has been created and signed um, to support anti-racism efforts um, at SHS and in the district in general. Um, there's been some progress within the anti-racism club itself um, and discussion about uh, collaborating with the um, DEI subcommittee of this group to get some efforts started. Um, in terms of academics, there's been uh, a number of students have been selected um, for the National Merit Scholar, uh, either finalists or just have been commended for their work in that role. Um, and then in terms of sports and extracurriculars, uh, I've heard from some people that uh, Facebook and Twitter have been really active reporting um, on how sports and stuff are going so kids get to know like the scores of games and stuff which is really nice because we haven't been able to go um, but we are able to stay a little bit more connected with each other so i've heard positive feedback from that um, we have the Citrus high drama club is doing an online performance of the play this fall so they're going to be doing a uh, clue on an online format and for the arts we have band and chorus um are able to start combining hybrid and in-person music making. So there'll be some new projects from those groups. Um, and that's all I have prepared. Okay, thanks. Uh, any questions or comments for Rosie? Rosie, I just have a general uh, question. Thanks for your, for your info. I'm curious how um, students are doing in terms of experiencing the hybrid model um, or the remote model. Like are you getting feedback from the other students? 
Yeah, so I actually was going to touch upon this tonight, and I was told not to, but um, so I was going to touch upon how in with the schedule, which I think everyone's done their absolute best, so no like complaints there. I just think students and teachers also are just a little stressed with the inconsistencies in the schedule with like certain blocks meeting more than others, which is natural and I think eventually will smooth out. I just think in terms of a transitional period right now, it's created a little bit of um, organizational struggles and inconsistencies, but um, in general, I think it's working um, as well as can be expected for such a difficult situation. Great, thank you. No, I think that, uh... You know, from our perspective as a, as a school committee, we um, you'll receive feedback from a lot of different um, stakeholders, students, parents, teachers, and so on. And from our perspective, um, we're, we're really happy with what's going on, but obviously like to hear from the students as well. So I appreciate that honest uh, feedback. Um, we'll get there. We're working to be the best district in the, in the world. I think that someday we'll get there. So thank you for, uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on the agenda, uh, new business. Uh, first up is Memorandum of Agreement, Situate Teachers Association, uh, Superintendent Burkhead. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Um, I want to, um, first of all, thank um, school committee members, uh, Lynn Blom and Long for their dedication and commitment to the uh, negotiation process. It was um, a long process, but a very important one with a document um, that I'm recommending the committee vote in the affirmative for today. The, the Situate Teachers Association has voted in the affirmative, I believe 92 to eight on this document. We have reviewed it in executive session. And um, I also wanna thank the Situate teachers that were on that committee. Um, and the teachers um, who voted for it. Um, it took a lot of work on their behalf. And um, I think it was a great compromise and a great way to start our relationship of building trust in the district on a document I think that has already started to move our district forward. So my recommendation would be for the school committee to vote in the affirmative for the uh, memorandum of, un of agreement between the school committee and the Situa Teachers Association. Any questions for the committee? Questions or comments? No, I, I just want to echo what Superintendent Burkett uh, said. I mean, throughout the conversations, it was it was very important that you know on both sides, it's safety and you know keeping our kids in the classroom and, and our staff um, was paramount. And you know that drove the discussions and helped us get to this agreement where we are tonight. And you know, still a lot of hard work, but again, it was all you know all about making sure we're safe and you know having a good ed education year um, this school year. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Uh, I move to approve the memorandum of agreement between the STA and the school committee on the reopening of schools for the 2020-2021 school year. Motion by Mr. Long, is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Limblom. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. We have four members in attendance tonight. Gates, yes. Brandolini? Yes. Long? Yes. Lillian Long? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, moving on, uh, declaration of surplus. Dr. Dutch. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, in your packet, you have a copy of a list of many different uh, either textbooks or resource materials and teacher, uh, teacher editions of some elementary series that are either outdated because of their age or because of changes in the curriculum. Uh, so for that reason, we are looking to add these to uh, our surplus list for uh, advertisement and bidding and if we don't receive bids or even if we do again we'll bring the bids back to you for your decision as to whether to uh, accept those bids or donate the materials elsewhere um, all right yeah 
answer any questions you have about uh, any item on this list. Questions or comments for Dr. Dutch? Seeing none, I would uh, entertain a motion. Uh, move to approve the Hadley, uh the materials that certain plans has presented. Motion by Mr. Long, is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Limblom. Uh, I'm gonna hold a roll call vote. Gates, yes. Brandolini? Yes. Long? Yes. Limblom? Yes. Motion passes four to zero. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, moving on, community pledge. Superintendent Burkhead. Thank you, Chairman Gates. I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. Y'all have that? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been very proud of our staff, students and families, administrators that have been working extremely hard uh, on preparations for reopening our schools and keeping everyone safe. I think we've done a really good job at that and I wanna thank everybody personally. Something that keeps me up at night and I think we've done a really good job of that and continue our, our vigilance. Um, so together we've created a, a Situate Health uh, Integrity Pledge, which stands for SHIP, which is appropriate for the Situate Sailors, uh, that we'd like uh, extended school community to adopt. This will significantly assist our district and town in keeping everyone safe and our schools open. It was shared this week on Thursday Thoughts and will be posted on our website and continually referred to. Um, and basically this is just a, um, uh, a commitment that we'd like the community members to take, our families, our community members that don't even have children in the schools, um, as well as our, our staff and me personally to take this pledge and, and continue to kind of uh, mitigate the spread of the COVID in our schools to keep our students, staff, and families safe. So again, I'm not gonna read every piece of it, but I will say it was um, developed with the input from the Medical Advisory Committee and um, has live links on them when we do share them. I will read the opening paragraph because I think that's important. Uh, to help prevent the spread of illness, all members of the Situate Public Schools community have a shared responsibility that extends beyond our campus and into our homes. It's crucial that we all remain committed to the current health and safety guidelines and in future communications to help keep students, faculty, and families safe. And then in the bold, by being a member of our school family, you agree to commit to doing your part to keep our community healthy and safe, whether on campus or off. And um, you know, I want everybody to know this isn't big brother stuff, that so we're not gonna come in and see what you're doing in our home. It's more of a trust building thing between what we're doing here in the school and protecting everybody and what we'd like to see um, based on the science that we ha have, what we'd like to see everybody do. And I, th I don't think anything is new here. I just think it's a good thing to, for us to all rally up around uh, because I have had community members say, you know, you talk about the community and, um, and wanting us to do our part. Well, what do, you, what, what do you want us to do? How can we help? So this is more of sharing a document that we can all follow, whether in school or at home. And uh, just for example, it talks about symptom checking. And, um, you know, if you have any symptoms listed, then we've sent um, home documents that have the symptoms listed on there and who to contact in that case. And we talk about in the next uh, paragraph, staying home if you're sick. Also gives a link to testing sites. And we're always happy as school nurses have been remarkable as a resource for helping folks answer any of these questions on this document, finding test sites or um, anything to do with uh, quarantining, uh, staying safe and such. So please contact us and our nurse leader Kelly Roach is also available to take those questions. Uh, notification of testing. Um, this has been you know, a really nice job. We haven't had a lot of students test positive, but I think the parents and, and caregivers have done a real nice job of notifying us. You know, because typically what happens is the Board of Health through their MAVEN system uh, is really slow, quite honestly, and, and, and they wouldn't find out for a few days later. So we typically find out first if it's a school member and we work with our uh, Board of Health who have been remarkable and we do the contact tracing and contact uh, identification um, with them. And then staying home if you've been exposed and it talks about guidelines, they have recently changed and we've updated those. So these are some things that uh, we want to share with people on what those are. And there are a lot of questions and uh, Q and A's about that. So we've got that in this document. 
So it's a lot of common sense stuff that people are doing anyways. And then there's a couple of nuances here that we hadn't had in our other document, following federal, state, and local orders. Um, this talks about large gatherings, you know, wearing a mask and six feet has been a common one. Um, but I just think it's the large groups without masks are really make me nervous around town. So if we could get some help with that, I think that would uh, allow me to sleep better at night. And then the travel, um, this, this changes. So we have a live link there for you to look at if you're thinking of traveling. I know college visits are coming up and there are reasons why you need to travel. So we just want to make sure you're up to date on the, what the um, state laws and recommendations are and what our responsibilities are on quarantining if necessary, going to certain parts of the country. So again, we have live links on there for you for this document. It'll be on our website. And um, we think if everyone kind of just follows this document and kind of unites and unifies behind it, um, we'll be and continue to be in really good shape as a town and as a school district. So I just want to thank everyone that had input into this. I also want to thank uh, Emily Matthews who did the design of the document. If you can see in the, uh, the watermark is a ship. Um, and so that's pretty cool. And if you don't have access to this, again, it'll be on the website. We'll put it again on this Thursday thoughts as well. Um, but it is a nice looking document too, if you wanted to print out and put on your fridge to help the kids, uh, as a reminder, that would be beneficial too. So I'll take any questions. It's not a voting matter. It's just more of a FYI that, um, We've been receiving a lot of questions about, you know, what, what would you like to see from the community? How can we support the schools? And this is kind of our answer to that. All right, thank you. Any uh, comments or questions from the committee? I can, I'll say something. Sure, Janet. Um, <laughs> no, I just want to thank Bill and his team for putting that together because, um, you know, we, we've, been, we've been lucky, I think, to stay, be able to stay in school to have the kids stay in school for as long as we have been you know i honestly thought we would be full remote a lot you know a few weeks in so um and we do rely on the community to help us continue to remain safe and you know keep COVID at bay so you know sticking this on your fridge would be a good reminder i think that's a good idea but uh th and thank you bill thank you yeah thank you Bill, I said, I guess one question, um, not directly related to this, but to some degree, I think that at least some families uh, or some students don't want to miss school. So they maybe get more conservative. Like maybe I was a contact, maybe I shouldn't be going to school today or but I really want to go. How can you help, um, I guess, soothe those nerves of missing school and feeling as if they're getting behind or, or other thing? Just if you could comment a little bit on that. I think that's, probably a pretty constant feeling for kids that just don't that that probably think they shouldn't go to school but they really want to yeah thank you chairman gates i think it's an excellent question and one of, i'm sure a lot of folks have in the family members and students um you know the answer is we we're going to be flexible on our attendance i think especially nowadays with the advent of zooms and our remote learning capabilities kids are um, if they do stay home and they're able to and let's say they they meet one of the criteria on the document with a, a pretty strong cough, but they're able to log in and, and attend their classes um, or do some of the work and then, uh, you know, take a nap when they need to, you know, we're still going to ultimately give them credit for that. So I, I don't want families and students to get nervous about attendance. The state has been uh, pretty clear on that, that we're going to be flexible in attendance. And um, so we'll, we'll figure that out with you and your families. But we, you know, we're basically telling you to stay home if you have that cause. So it's our responsibility to get you the education and to make sure that we address the, um, in fact, we have special um, columns now in the attendance tracking where we say, okay, you know, staying home because of a, you know, a cough or a related COVID related um, something on our list that we're asking them to stay home to. So we keep track of that so that they'll be getting credit for that. So um, excellent question. So you're not going to be punished for us asking you to stay home to be safe. So I would always err on the side of caution. Uh, and if you're well enough to attend virtually on, uh, at home, do that so you don't miss a day of learning and you're caught up and you're protecting yourself and other people. Okay, great. Thanks. I think that's helpful. Hopefully it will be helpful to a lot of families out there that don't want their kids to miss school because of attendance reasons. But I think that uh, we're all looking out for the uh, health and safety of our school community. So can err on the side of caution. So thank you for that. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right, we're moving right along. Um, 
Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion position, Mr. Bill Burkhead, Superintendent. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Uh, this is a request on the job description. It is a new position to the district. Um, you know, we had talked a lot about um, in, in our DEI conversations and uh, goals this year about um, addressing some of our marginalized students and families. And um, also that, um, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that I need some help in that area. Uh, we also, I also needed help with the safe and strong reopening and the community rose to that occasion. Um, I think they did the same with this and there's still work to be done, obviously. Uh, we had talked about a, um, Dr. Worm coming in to train our staff and that's happening. I think uh, that gets expensive and it's a, uh, someone coming from the outside and then leaving. Um, you know, I think it was really important for us to put our money where our mouth is and have a position that can do this work. And as I found out with the DEI committee with 60 people, you know, there's a lot of varying opinions. And, um, you know, I think that's important. And, and, uh, but I also think, you know, hiring someone that we can have here full time to, you know, um, you know, work with us on these committees, but also to do some training so that we don't have to get consultants all the time. And if you look at the job description, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. It involves training of our staff, uh, also working with our kids uh, to have someone in the buildings that can, you know, after incidents happen or uh, in preparation to um, support our students, we have someone whose sole job is to do that and to look out for those kids and to uh, work with that. So um, that's kind of where this came from in a nutshell. Um, I want to be clear also that this is no extra cost to the budget. Um, and I know our staff uh, and, and administrators have sacrificed furlough days. So I'm very well aware of that. And before coming forward and presenting this, I wanted to be very clear to those folks out there that, um, you know, we're not getting top heavy here at central office. This is a needed position. And the money comes from saving in our personnel areas. For example, we had uh, through retirements, we had um, a lot of unpaid one-year leaves this year that um, we were able to rehire at a, at a cheaper cost uh, because of uh, newer teachers were coming on board. Um, not having to staff certain positions because we're doing remote. So the cost savings there is translated into this position and we'd have to um, be responsible in our future budgets to budget it in. And I also want to mention that the furlough days, you know, according to our memorandum of understanding, are directly correlated to um, revenues from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the federal government, which uh, is still forthcoming. The Chapter 70 money is um, still on its way. I know the governor had talked about the budget, and I thought it was I was optimistic about it, the, the budget. So I am still optimistic about those furlough days and getting them back. So that's not a foregone conclusion, nor should this position impact that. So I wanted everyone out there to know that, that they are, they can be mutually exclusive. We can have this position and get furlough days back. So I wanted everyone there to, to understand that. Um, I can share the screen and kind of highlight some of the position because it's pretty lengthy just to give people a flavor for what this position would be. And if there's anybody out there in the audience that may be interested, should this um, position be approved this evening? Um, see if I can... Okay. So this will be an administrative position. It's going to have a lot of responsibilities. Um, so I'll kind of summarize that first part. It's, we're looking for a committed, dynamic, and equity-driven leader to join our district. Uh, as its uh, founding director, this will be obviously the first. There's a handful of districts that have this position, but we would probably be one of the few in this area. The director of diversity, equity, and inclusion will foster deep and meaningful relationships that prioritize the dignity of our most disenfranchised community members, providing coordination, accountability, and support for all stakeholders to advance our commitment to becoming an anti-racist school district. Uh, working in partnership with students, staff, caregivers, and situate school community, the director of DEI will guide a range of activities and initiatives to include racial equity and anti-racism, school climate and culture and relationships, and family and youth engagement. This is a central office position. The director of diversity, equity, and inclusion will report directly to the superintendent of the schools. And then if I could just pull out a few bullets here, I know that was heavy on, on the race piece up here, but I really want to emphasize that this is for 
um, all um, um, typically marginalized groups that uh, this position would cover all of that. And I think it hits that in this, uh, the bullets here. So some of the duties and responsibilities are broken down and it does focus here on the racial equity piece, which is important in our society and our school district right now. Um, so the first bullet there serves as the primary steward of anti-racism dialogues and district-wide trainings. So we're kind of doing that on our own right now. This person would you know, have experience with that and come in and assist us with that. I think that's huge. And we don't have to keep um, hiring consultants to do that work. That person will be on, you know, our payroll. Uh, the third bullet I just want to hit, hit here: align SBA uh, Situa Public School District goals with Situa Public School Committee anti-racism -res resolution. I know we're going to talk about the resolution tonight, but there should be um, a connection between the superintendent's goals, teacher goals, all that, and kind of aligned. And this person can help realize those um, those goals that are being aligned and met. Uh, so. And I'm going to jump down to the seventh bullet. Uh, work with human resources director to recruit and hire educators with BIPOC groups. Uh, that stands for uh, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, so, you know, it's important that your, um, I think that your student body reflects your staffing. And right now, the percentage of students of color, we don't have the staffing that reflects that. It's important that kids look at adults that look like them, and they think that's, research has proven that to be true, and I think we can do a, uh, a better job and then I think we're doing a good job at that this year and I think we'll be able to share some of those stats with you but uh, that person can help with recruiting and, and that kind of stuff of, of staff to come to situate. And I think that's a highlight of this job description. The last one here is enhance the uh, availability of culturally responsive practices and modalities that honor the, the lived experiences of black indigenous and people of color students and family. You know to me that there is that you know how are we celebrating you know how are we celebrating these people that have felt marginalized? How are we, um, you know, showing these young kids that um, there's role models out there that look like them and, um, and get excited about that? So I think that was an important piece. Again, I'm not going to read every bullet. Then if we get to school climate and relationships, the first bullet talks about support and guide the district implementation of restorative, restorative approaches to discipline practices. You know, and that was a big one that was talked about with some of the incidents at the high school recently was, um, you know, what's the punishment? What's going to happen? What's, and I think we, we need to educate everyone on and understand restorative practices. And ultimately, we, we want the crime to fit the punishment, obviously, but even more importantly, as, um, as an educator, that we teach kids right from wrong, and we help them learn from their experiences and be better people. And I, and I think that's what that's all about. So we'll be looking for this person to kind of look at some of the things we're doing and help us with that. Uh, the next bullet there talks a little bit about identify, identify and invest in opportunities that build positive school climates, including support for those who have been historically marginalized. So this talks about all people that have been marginalized and um, in their lives and uh, in our community. And so this isn't knocking anybody down, it's building people up. And I think that I want that to be the theme that's very clearly understood, that we want to build people up that have not felt built up. Um, and, you know, and make sure that that's happening. So I think that's important to, to mention on that point. And culture is important. The school culture and climate and the district culture and climate um, needs to get better. And I think we're doing a lot of work that will improve that, and we're getting a lot of quick victories already. And so I want people to be optimistic and hopeful about that. But this person, again, is not the panacea, but someone that can kind of be the glue to kind of put all these great things that we're doing, kind of keep it all together and keep it in one direction so that it's organized and productive. And then the last part uh, here is family and youth engagement. Um, and then I just the third bullet down on this one here is lead the creation of spaces that foster community dialogue, including family affinity groups, community conversation and advisory groups. You know, it's important to me that our community has this conversation too. And, and you know, I often think of this, uh, you know, Mr. Gates quoted it tonight is we're going to be the best school district in the world. Oftentimes schools are the nucleus of great communities. And I think that um, having those conversations that are productive, healthy, and um, get us all on the same page are important. So I think this person should have experience in working with the community groups, the families to, to bring us together and to have difficult conversations and try to move things forward so that everyone uh, is valued and respected and cared for. 
Um, and the last bullet here, foster strong ties to town and community partnerships that support family engagement. You know, I know our town's doing work on this area as well. So having someone that kind of connects between the town and what the schools are doing is that other piece that will you know, hopefully unify us all and bring us together. So that's a piece I wanted to point out. Um, and that's kind of like the, you know, this person is super person if you had all of these things. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, I, think, I, I think we already have Dr. Dutch, so we have to be somebody else, Dr. Dutch. <laughs> um, and I see him laughing, so that, I didn't mean to wake you there, Dr. Dutch. Okay. <laughs> so the skill set here, um, again, I'm not going to read all these, but we are looking for the best person out there um, in, in this skill set to meet, um, you know, the third bullet, commitment to and experience with engaging all school stakeholders, including students, parents, and caregivers, educators, and other strategic partners with an emphasis on advocating for the voices of members representing historically marginalized groups. So that's a really powerful statement to me. That one hit home to me that, you know, that those marginalized groups know that they have a voice and that all that, but that person also is, is there to unify all voices and, and try to, you know, to bring those people up. So I really like that. I think there's, I think there are people out there that can do this work and that, that, that was a good one for me. Then uh, a proven track record of navigating complex issues, leading change and driving strong results. The ability to work across teams and with all leaders is essential. All right. There's another important one to me. I think they're all important. These kind of stuck out to me and I wanted to share them with you. Um, so someone that has a, a proven track record, this is a very complex issue. It's an emotional issue. Um, it's an important issue. And, it's, you know, this position to me just represents that we're not afraid of it, that we're going to take it head on and we're going to deal with it. Um, and we're going to be much better for it. So um, I'll read one more bullet here. <laughs> Understanding of trauma and the ways in which it can manifest in BIPOC communities. You know, I've been talking to a lot of people of color since I, um, the high school incident and since I took the job over. And it's been really a, a powerful experience for me um, because they've been quite candid and honest and open. And I really appreciate that. So for all those folks that I've met and had personal conversations or group conversations with, thank you for that because it made me a better person to understand what you're going through and not through my lens, things I wouldn't even think of. So I think that's how we learn by just kind of, opening our ears and minds and listening to people and what their experiences were could be very different than ours. And um, so the trauma piece is real and it's in our town and it doesn't mean it's a bad town. I've only been here a few months. I love it here. And there's a lot of good. So I, I just think there, but there is trauma. And I think that, um, you know, that's an important key to this job description is kind of let's get us through that. And how do we do it? And, and how does this professional gather other professionals and leaders around and community members, students and families to kind of work through that and heal. So um, there's more to it here. Qualifications on the bottom is bachelor's degree required, uh, master's degree preferred, experience in educational setting preferred. Again, we don't want to rule too many people out. We want to give some guidelines here. Um, and employment obviously based on a quarry and fingerprinting background. So I'll take any questions. That's all I have for that. I can get out of the stuff. All right, thank you for that. I'm gonna open up to the committee. Uh, initially, uh, any questions or comments from the committee in the Center for Performing Arts? <laughs> I have a comment. Um, thank you, Bill, for presenting that. <clears throat> I think it's, um, this will definitely be a positive for the district. Um, you know, thinking back to the, the few times where we've had to sit up here and listen to parents whose child is afraid to come to school because of something that happened, you know, related to the color of their skin. It's a very helpless feeling and you want to do anything to make that feeling go away. Um, they need to be supported. So hopefully this is a, I think this is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lindblom. Yeah, Any other comments? Uh, I, I just have a couple. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Superintendent Burkett, for this. Can you, um, I guess, one, are there other districts, either locally or countrywide, that are introducing or have these positions in place? 
Yes, and I'll defer to, I know Ms. Arnold's on this call, but I know uh, Milton's done a lot of work with this. I've spoken to the superintendent over there. They were just interviewing uh, about a month ago for this position. I think Burlington is starting this position. I believe Newton has this position. Uh, Ms. Arnold, anybody else that I missed? I know you researched this. Uh, Brookline and Cambridge both have positions. Okay. This is curious. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's a great um, recommendation. Um, I think that it's going to, you know, help the district really uh, make some progress in this. Um, you know, we can, we can say lots of things, but when we have someone actually that's responsible for doing it, um, I think that we'll see some progress much more efficiently. Um, I'm assuming, I anticipate that there are a lot of qualified candidates out there. Um, and if there are, I hope that they do uh, ultimately uh, make the application. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. Ms. Brandlini. Um, just to add to that too, your question, uh, just in some of the uh, other school committee uh, chatter, they, there are a lot of districts that desire a position like this, but might not have the, the means to make such a hire at this time. So I think it's really nice that we're, uh, we're very lucky to be in a position that um, Superintendent Burkhead and Dr. Dutch and everybody has been able to do this work and kind of make this such a priority for our district to get this um, even on the table. I think it's fantastic and I fully support it. Any other questions or comments? So again, uh, Superintendent Burke, just for the folks who are joining us, um, the reason that this job description was presented was simply for the school committee to approve it since it's a new position in our district. Um, we approve those um, those job descriptions, and then it's up to you and, and others to, to determine the best candidates to hire. It's true, Chairman Gates. Okay. Just want to let everyone know why this, I mean, we don't review every single job description now that they're in place, but when a new one gets introduced, um, the process is to bring it before the school committee for us to approve the job description. So that's what we would be, that's what we're discussing now and we'll be voting on uh, very shortly. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just had one question. Um, just kind of going off Nicole's comment, Bill, have we talked to any other communities to see if we could share this across some other local towns? Or I know there's a DEI committee with the um, town, you know, using that person to leverage both the town side and the school side. So it's not, you know, just focused inside the school. Yes, and I think that, you know, we can do that when we are in the hiring process too, is those will be some of the questions and that's kind of one of the things bullets I pointed out that's important that that person either has experience or is capable of kind of bringing the town and the schools together. And I think um, those places that Jen and I mentioned that do have it, do have connections to all those schools. So we can reach out to them and seeing how's the job working out? How's it working for you? How are you making those connections and kind of learn from them if they've already gone that far? Well, I'm even thinking combine this position with like a Cohasset or a Hingham, you know, maybe share the cost a little bit, but it's something that we can, you know, if five other towns can't pay for this, or, you know, if we don't want to continue to have this be a bur uh, impact to our budget over the next couple of years, you know, just sharing that cost, but sharing that resource so that as a local area, we're all on the same page. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think like Ms. Brandolini said, there's a lot of districts that are trying to get this. And I think, um, you know, we have been very careful with our resources and our staffing, uh, anticipating whatever that we might need to replace positions or, you know, and I think um, earlier in the year, the school committee had committed to an early retirement um, package that I think has benefited us as well. Um, and I will also say this, this job, since we're in um, mid-October, the posting position, the hiring, if this were to be passed, you know, the, the job is prorated. The salary would be prorated. So it's not going to, again, worth two or three months in, it's not going to be uh, as much as it would be yearly. So I think it's a good point moving forward that we keep that on the table as a potential for building our budget and possibly connecting with other communities to save money. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, I would entertain a motion. Um, I'll make the motion. Uh, make a motion that the school committee vote to approve the directory, director of diversity, equity, and inclusion job description as written. Second. 
Motion by Ms. Limblom, second by Ms. Brandolini. Uh, roll call vote. Gates, yes. Long? Yes. Limblom? Yes. Brandolini? Yes. Motion passes four to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, on the agenda next is our first um, first opportunity for public comment. If you do have a comment, please use the emoji in the bottom to raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute yourself. I am seeing none. Anyone else? My eyes deceiving me. No, no. No hands raised at this point, so we will move on the agenda, um, which is a leadership report. Back to you, Superintendent Burkhead. Thank you. And I will say, if people are getting sick of hearing me tonight, thank you for your <laughs> patience. Um, now you know how my family feels. Um, we will be starting, uh, we taught, had a leadership meeting today, a central office leadership meeting, and um, we'll start having our uh, leadership team present um, at every meeting. So you'll be hearing from Dr. Dutch, uh, Dr. Bobert and Ms. Uh, Arnold uh, throughout the um, upcoming meeting. So we'll have a report out in each of those areas. And um, I didn't want to drag out Ms. Donahue, who's been um, up to her eyeballs and uh, personnel as you can manage. HR is one of the hardest jobs in the world right now. So we'll, we'll keep her off the, off the front lines for now. So um, real quick, uh, I wanted to bring up, um, you know, we're in budget season, obviously, these are, these are challenging times, um, you know, and, and trying to build relationships with our town and, and sharing in the expense, expenses. Um, we've asked the town to include um, a couple of items on the um, special town meeting warrant. And the first one is full day kindergarten. And it would appear under Article 3. Um, and what we're asking for is uh, transfer uh, from town funds to the school in the amount of four hundred fifty thousand um, dollars to offset unrealized revenue as a result of COVID-related closure of our full-day kindergarten program, uh, we have uh, we have submitted a request for reimbursement through the Coronas Relief Funds uh, to Plymouth County uh, while we wait for that warrant article appro approval, and um, so we're trying basically all avenues to to get that money back. And basically the uh, lost revenue is, um, you know, we're, we're a fee-based district in regards to kindergarten. And when we were planning uh, for this year, we realized that full day wouldn't be an option for a while anyways. And we made the clear commitment we learned from last year about reimbursements and collecting money. You know, it gets, and people are in tough times. So we appreciate all that. We made the commitment, um, you know, we're not in full day because of social distancing, so we didn't have a choice to go, go um, full day. So it's our belief that, or we're hoping the town um, can can help us realize that money back and help our budget. And so we've got that on. Uh, Dr. Dutch and I will be on tour this week, going to the advisory uh, selectman meeting tomorrow, the advisory meeting on Wednesday, um, and then unrelated, but the final financial forecast meeting on Thursday. So that's one thing. And I, you know, again, I, I think it's important that there was uh, no fault of anybody that we weren't able to offer that kindergarten experience. They're still getting a good education. Um, and it's our goal. And just to point out something very clearly that I uh, know we'll make this point to our select board tomorrow is that this is a one-time ask for this amount because of the situation uh, moving forward. We'll, um, it's our goal to get rid of this fee. It was my goal when I got the job. Um, you know, I know it's a hardship on um, families, and uh, it's probably not the best way to run a, a run a budget as we've seen. So we're 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 in the hole. Uh, no fault of our own. We're asking the town for some help for for this year, and then we'll work our tails off to realize um, a fee free kindergarten in the future. Um, Dr. Dutch, anything to add to that? No, I think you've uh, explained everything quite well. <laughs> yep. And so I'm gonna, the next one we um, would like to also put on the warrant was 
was passed by the school committee last year would be special education stabilization fund. Dr. Dutch, can you talk a little bit about this? Yes, um, so last year, uh, you as a school committee uh, voted to establish a special education reserve fund, uh, which is intended to set aside resources in the event of unexpected special education expenses. Somebody moves into town who has an out of district placement we did not budget for. This is a perfect example of that sort of uh, situation. Uh, potentially those are, are real budget busters. So um, having those funds available uh, in a fund that would not expire within 12 months like your, your circuit breaker funds do uh, would be a benefit. Obviously there's, there's a threshold to how much you can put into that fund. Um, and there's a process for putting money into the fund and taking money out. And in both cases, it requires a vote of the school committee and vote of town meeting. Uh, so this has been placed on the agenda for the special town meeting in November. But we wanted it uh, to be on your radar that that is uh, that's on the agenda as well. Again, I'm happy to answer any questions related to that. Thank you, Dr. Dutch. I guess I'll pause there and, and in my report to yeah. turn it back over to Chairman Gates to see if there's any questions or comments on that from the I said, I'll, just, uh, I'll just add to Dr. Dutch's comment. The reason that um, the stabilization um, fund is coming up again is simply that the annual town meeting in when was it june was cut short because of COVID, so that item was taken off so it's just being it was just delayed as many other items were across town to the special town meeting in november um, i think also what's important on this is that this is just the creation of the stabilization fund as dr dutch mentioned um this does not create act, put actual dollars into that yet but we need to first authorize the setup of or the town needs to authorize set up of the stabilization fund, then they need to fund on, uh, I guess, vote or determine how to actually fund that. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be something that would be funded every year necessarily. Uh, but just want to let everyone know that this, these were just, that's the reason that these were delayed. We ideally could have had them approved back in June, but unfortunately, as with most things pandemic related, um, just being delayed. Um, any other, any questions or comments so far? Nope. Thank you, Chairman Gates. Thank you for that insight. Uh, next on the diversity, equity, and inclusion subcommittee, um, on Tuesday, October 13th, we had our final subcommittee meeting to complete our anti-racism resolution draft, which will be presented next. I just wanted to thank personally the 60 people, 60 members of that subcommittee. That's a lot of people, um, a lot of work went on. And, Again, a lot of hard work and difficult conversations. So I want to just thank you all for participating and, be, and putting yourself out there for that. Um, I'd also personally like to thank uh, school committee members, Nicole Brandolini and Janice Lindblom for all their hard work. A lot of hours, again, a lot of time went into this um, work. And so I personally want to thank you. And uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Arnold, who was the co-chair, a lot of time and effort and in preparation for the meetings and the work that was done. And finally, our outstanding facilitators um, who did the breakout sessions, had difficult conversations, organized documents, prepared agendas, along with Ms. Arnold and Ms. Brindolini and Ms. Lindblom. So thank you all. I'm very impressed with all of you and, and feel very good about the future. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is something else I'm proud of here with the district um, is our ability to work collaboratively with the, with the town of Situate to have uh, COVID uh, free COVID testing for our staff. And uh, today we finally wrapped that up uh, over a week long course. And um, I'm having superintendents reach out to me, can I get information on that? How'd you do it? We wanna do it. And so I, I think leading the charge and that was very important. I think it was a promise that we made to our staff that we would do everything we could to get them testing. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Dutch and his efforts for making you know, that happened and being very dogged and in, in, in finding a way to make it happen. I want to 
thank Mr. Boudreau, the town administrator, and collaborating with us to make it available for the town employees as well. I think it's just been a great partnership. So um, our school nurse leader, Kelly Roach, and high school nurse, Ellen Claffin, um, kind of took, took the, the show on the road and went school to school and opened up hours, had people sign up. There was a lot of technology to it, connecting to the company, a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that it was safe and done well. And they did that. In total, we tested 302 uh, school and town employees. And to date, we've received 272 test results back, all negative. So I wanted to uh, share that good news as well. And it's just, it's a great peace of mind to have. So I thought uh, it's very important to share that with you. Uh, one test was unable to be processed by the lab due to a, a swab issue. And so that person will retest in November. Uh, as today was our last day. And again, the rest have been negative. Um, and those that were tested today, including myself, will have their results back uh, tomorrow. So a huge Taylor shout out to the building principals, the secretarial staff for helping to arrange coverage and to making this happen. There's a lot of work that went into this. Um, our custodians for helping us get set up, um, power strips, equipment, Rich Long for the technical expertise that this entailed, uh, Bob Burke and his town hall staff for their hospitality and coordination for the town hall testing day, and um, to Dave Raphael, who was our uh, driver that took the res results personally, drove them into Cambridge each day. We felt it very important to not waste time in the mail or get them lost or damaged. Uh, Dave stepped up to personally drive them each day so the results were there a day quicker, people got them back quicker and just a great job and just a show of community teamwork there by Dave, thank you. Um, and so I think that's, that's it for the, that. So job well done and thank you for everyone that took advantage of that. And finally, uh, I just wanted to give an update on the Remote Learning Center. Um, again, another promise to our staff and community that we were going to do everything we could to um, try to find some support in childcare and keep kids learning. And we're getting close to um, an opportunity for folks to have um, for those uh, situate kids that are going to the AM or PM uh, K through five school that we'll have an opportunity to, uh, we've, again, we're collaborating with the town to use space in the old gate school to have an opportunity for kids uh, on the opposite cohort day to um, go over and work on their um, assignments um, online, um, have, be able to eat their lunch, go out and get some fresh air. Um, so we're in the process of hiring our staff this week. Uh, there is a cost to this, obviously, to cover, to, it's a break-even situation to cover for the staff and any expenditures. Um, flyers will be going out next week to the staff and community for those interested in this opportunity. It will explain it in a lot more detail and then we'll be able to answer questions at that time. Uh, and our hopeful and expected start date is mid-November to late November at the latest. Um, so I wanna thank everybody involved with their hard work on that. And we look forward to helping provide a service to our community uh, through our remote learning center. And that's my report for tonight. Great. Thank you very much for all that. And uh, uh, I can speak for the uh, school committee. Thank you and Dr. Dutch and, and whoever else was involved in uh, somehow getting the entire staff and, and town hall employees tested. I, I still don't know how you guys did it, but I know that that um, is exactly what most folks were looking for. So I appreciate that. And, and best of all, glad to hear that they're all so far negative. So thanks again for that. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, we will move on the agenda. Uh, next up are the subcommittee reports. Um, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Subcommittee report. Uh, Ms. Arnold and Ms. Brandolini. Thank you, Chairman Gates. She should be um, I just like to reiterate what the superintendent said about our committee, that we had so many people who were highly motivated, smart people, intelligent, um, who really came together for us to do this work. Um, so I just like to do a quick review of the whole process that we had. 
So we convened in July. The school committee had asked us to put together sub or had proposed a subcommittee for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And specifically, our job was to draft an anti-racism resolution. So our first meeting, uh, we talked about what an anti-racism resolution actually was. I had given um, homework for people to do ahead of time. To, we had collected dra um, some drafts and then other anti-racism resolutions or diversity, equity, and inclusion statements or um, websites across not only in Massachusetts, but across the country of the work they were doing. So that's sort of, with all that information, we put together a, a lot of documents that people had the ability to read ahead of time. And so in that first meeting, we had breakout groups and people discussed um, the components they had read and, and it was just mostly a conversation to, to get it started to understand the scope of the work. And people were, it was, people expressed their strong feelings about what should be included in the resolution. Uh, that first meeting on July 28th, and then the subsequent meeting, the next meeting rather, didn't happen until October 1st. Um, unfortunately, there was a lot of, a lot of safe and strong work that we were doing reopening the schools. So it was unfortunate that we had to delay that next meeting, but when we came together, we had people in groups and we kept the people in group, the, their assigned group for the second meeting and the third. So in the second meeting, um, the facilitators who are the advisory team came back and, and me. Um, we had met and we came back with a draft resolution. And this was our very first draft resolution. Again, people went into breakout groups, discussed it. Um, some of the conversation was, was uncomfortable for a lot of people. We, we were trying to build consensus. So the point was not everybody would agree with everything all the time, but we had to have consensus. So the facilitators worked through that second meeting. After that meeting, we came back as the advisory team looked at all the feedback and um, put, put out another draft resolution. And then at the third meeting last week, we took our closest final draft, brought it to that last meeting, and in the groups, the same groups, um, breakout groups, facilitators helped those conversations and we had some final feedback, which we took and compose or develop the resolution draft you see in front of you. We developed that on Thursday following our Tuesday meeting. So I just wanted to give you that history. And I'd like to thank all of the facilitators who helped with this work, not only facilitating conversations, but also helped in pulling this all together. They're, they were really a, an incredible group. All of the people involved in this work were invested, had strong feelings, were wanted to see, want to see Situat be successful and be a district that is not racist, that is anti-racist. And so we had we did a lot of work with that, but the facilitators also did navigated difficult conversations and were able to help me pull this all together. And um, those people are John Scopoletti, Megan Gregory, Steve Sweat, Jim Thomas, Lindsay Newton, uh, Lisa McGuire, Ryan Beatty, Karen Hughes, Sam Lesniak, and I think that's all we Yes, Michelle Crawford, how can I forget Michelle? All of those people were on our advisory team and our facilitators and did the bulk of this work. So I'd like to recognize them publicly again. So the, in the anti-racism resolution draft, 
we have our opening statement, and it's a strong statement. Uh, I, I will read this one for you, but I won't read everything. We believe that anti-racism is a commitment at both the institutional and personal levels to do more than simply not be racist. It is the active and ongoing practice of challenging values, structures, and behaviors that perpetuate systemic racism while also supporting the humanity, uniqueness, and experiences of Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color, BIPOC. That is our opening statement that really sets the tone for the, for the entire resolution. And then all of our facets here, um, each number. We, what we hope to do, or what we are going to do, is that we are going to face this issue that we have of racism within our school head on. And we, we are actively going to address it. We're going to make sure that we understand all the incidences of racism, um, hate crimes, hate speak. We're going to train our faculty so that they, our whole staff rather, so that they understand what that means, what it is, so they can recognize it. Um, we are going to ensure that we create environments for all students of all colors and all people of all colors so they do feel safe to learn. Harken back to Superintendent Burkhead's comment and Ms. Limblon's comment about how heartbreaking it is to think that kids don't feel safe in school and, and they have to. And this last statement in number one is another I have to read because this is, we felt strongly this was important to include. All lives cannot matter until the lives of BIPOC matter. And BIPOC is the, an acronym for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Um, we are going to make sure that we diversify our literature, respond culturally to all of the issues within our, our um, student body and staff. We want to make sure that students see someone they recognize within all of their curriculum, literature, people who are in their building. We, we are striving to become a more holistic place. Um, we are going to do an initial equity audit, which means basically it's a, it's a it's a if it's done well, it's really it gets down to some really important questions that may be difficult to think about for people who aren't experiencing racism. So it's a it's a good hard look at ourselves, and it helps us understand where we need to go next. So it would be a benchmark of uh, foundational data that would help us take the next steps. And we will annually review all of those things that all of the data that we had initially and measure ourselves to see have we, you know, have we improved and where have we improved and where do we have places to go? Where do we have growth? Um, we also thought it was important to talk about tracking, that we should track all of these instances of hate crimes and hate speech and racist incidents, and that it should be, people should understand the clear consequences for their behaviors when it comes to any of these racist behaviors, racist um, actions, hate crimes, hate speech they're involved in. And we will have a, a consequence or a code of conduct and with consequences. We feel that's important to develop. Um, also, again, to be transparent with that. We understand that our staff, our faculty have a need some professional development or need to understand more about the world in which 
people of color live and they need to, because we are such a white staff and we, we don't have the same understanding as people of color have. We haven't had those experiences where we have been called names that cut across the, our, our identities. You know, some of us have, but not as a rule. And, and people of color face that every day and we don't want that to happen. So we're committed to dedicating time so that all staff understand um, how to respond, how to have these difficult conversations, um, to be able to review all of their all of their curricula and their resources for racial disparities, um, and then really opening up conversations amongst themselves to to make growth in this area. Uh, Superintendent Burkhead went over this one. Number seven, we commit to hiring and retaining supporting and supporting a diverse faculty and staff reflective of the demographics of the world beyond situate. This is really important. One of the things that our graduating class classes have said when they come back to the district is that they didn't feel prepared for the world. When they got out there, they saw a lot of people that didn't look like them, who they hadn't met before and they didn't, they didn't felt they didn't felt they didn't feel like they were optimally prepared so that's something that you know we're hoping um through all these actions having more diverse faculty having the opportunity to have speakers come in having the opportunity to have constructive conversations with peers who are not necessarily their color that it, this is something we have to do because not to do it is really education malpractice in my mind. Um, and then we, we have to really focus on supporting students who have been marginalized. We need to give them um, a construct of a, we need to give them space where they can meet and discuss and just get away, um, take a time out for it, for reflection or to think about their next steps if they've been hurt um, or they can talk to a teacher, but we need to have a construct for that. We need to set aside physical spaces and we need to allocate time for it. Um, and then the final sentence is district commits itself to, to this work because everyone in the Situate Public Schools family deserves to feel represented, safe, and supported. Nicole, would you like to add anything? Uh, thank you, Sister and Super, Assistant Superintendent Arnold. Um, I just wanted to add to that um, as Superintendent Burke had said, and you had said, just uh, commend the work of all the members of the subcommittee, staff and faculty and parents and community members and students and alumni and everybody. Um, it was, it's ongoing work, but it's, to me, it's, it's really the most important work we can do to support and empower our students and um, make them feel safe, because if you're not safe, you cannot learn well. Uh, so and that's why we're all here. So, um, you know, so this was kind of just a foundation for our work here. And obviously there's more to come. So that being said, I just wanted to touch on um, a few next steps to share with the school committee too for our subcommittee group. So now that we are at the point of voting on this resolution and this work will kind of be hopefully with a, an approved vote, um, kind of checked off the list. Our next steps for this is to sort of structure and or sort of the structure will be recrafted here. So we would kind of shift into more of an advisory group to the superintendent. And that will kind of sort of channel us nicely into um, as Superintendent Burkhead had presented hiring the director of diversity, equity and inclusion for the district. So um, this work kind of leads us to that next step. Resolution sets the tone and standard we're able to then move to hitting some of those goals, which, what, which would include hiring that director. 
Um, so that's kind of where we're at with next steps. So it's just more of a restructuring of the subcommittee. So we'd recraft, restructure. And because there's so many people who want to do this work, we want to make sure that it's done correctly. So that said, if it's an ongoing procedure, we want to make sure that we're following open meeting laws and things like that and sticking, um, you know, we want to make sure that we follow procedures accordingly. So with such a large group, it's important to have um, the proper setup. So that would be my recommendations based on um, some of the research I've done and conversations I've had with the Mass Association of School Committees in terms of how we should restructure things going forward so that we are able to continue the work efficiently and properly. Um, so if anyone had any other questions about that or if Janice had anything she wants to add to. No, I would just add what you and Jen both said about the, um, you know, a group of 60 people that would, you know, it was a, it was a great group, you know, lots of good ideas and the facility, I can only speak to the facilitator in my group who's excellent, you know, kept us focused and um, as I'm sure all the other facilitators did as well. But um, no, I want to thank everybody who participated and we have a great resolution, I feel, to vote on tonight. Yeah, and I think Mr. Long had mentioned at our last meeting about, um, you know, how could the structure of this look going forward? And obviously now with the ability to hire the director, that might um, change because we'd want to get that person's voice involved. But, um, you know, there's so many areas and facets to work on. So, I mean, curriculum things and, um, you know, any, any layer of the district. So, I mean, certainly we want people to participate and we want people to be involved, obviously. So, um, I think it's more of a stay tuned as we restructure and kind of um, get to the next steps. But we look forward to continuing to work with the group that, um, you know, that we've been working with, too. So there'll be lots of. Um, additional things coming down the lane. Yeah, I think I think the resolution was the biggest, the biggest thing we had to, the biggest lift mm -hmm. for the for a DEI committee advisory. Um, so I feel yeah. you know everything else will fall into place. Yeah. Great. Um, I'll just echo all the sentiments. Thanks again to everyone, the 60 plus members, plus uh, Ms. Limbaugh and Ms. Brandolini um, that participated in these um, lengthy discussions. Uh, I just want to go even one step back and say how we even got to asking for a resolution. Um, I know I've said this a couple of times, but I think this was in May or early June, uh, the mask organization uh, was asking all of their representative school committees to sign um, kind of a boilerplate anti-racism resolution. Um, I, as well as other committee members, felt that we needed to make ours specific to situate um, so they would be deliverable and identifiable. And that was ultimately the reason that we had recommended, I guess, or asked for the creation of this DEI subcommittee. Um, as time has worn on, uh, we've kind of um, morphed or um, progressed into where we are now. Super, we have new leader between the initial June resolution request and now we have new leadership uh, and we're going in the direction where superintendent mentioned again today that um, police will be posting for this DEI coordinator and think that we can go in that direction. So just want to give a little bit of background on why we even having this work done because it was a lot of time and effort that was taken to do it. Um, and again, we've gone through a leadership change and, and I think that we're going to um, begin to approach it from a different perspective um, or a different uh, method. But I just wanted to thank again everyone that was involved. I know that as school committee members, we're involved in an awful lot of things. Um, but when we're not, like I didn't have anything to do with all the time and effort that went on behind the scenes. And I know that there were hours and hours of, of everyone's efforts and time taken away from their families and sitting on Zoom. So I appreciate it again. Um, I think that I have a couple of very specific questions about the resolution. I don't know if I can ask them. Could I ask them? Um, I guess in terms of the audit, uh, the cultural audit, is there a, a timing of it? Um, who coordinates it? Is there an expense to it? 
much. Oh, there are different ways you can do it, Chairman Gates. You can um, hire an outside company to do it. Okay. Actually, part of the CPR, the Coordinated Program Review, uh, now part of MTSS, it's a uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they come in and uh, they look at special education specifically and then civil rights. So they will ask for all sorts of documents and they will look at our handbooks. And one of the things that, that we had to do last year um, under our review was we had to do a, an institutional self-assessment. And basically what that was is an audit, uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion audit. It, it actually went beyond that because it was about how do people feel when they're at school? Do they feel represented? Do they feel like their teachers understand their issues? So, you know, it was, it was you were asked to um, designate your race, your sexual identity, um, if you had an IEP or a 504. So it went all of the, it tried to gather data on every single identifiable group. Um, and so it, it was those kinds of questions and that we have to do for the state. We did it last year. So that's one thing um, that we have that we could do again. We have baseline data. You can hire an outside company to come in and um, so someone totally objective who doesn't know anything about us. And yes, that would be an expense. So there are different ways to do it. Okay. Um, and my last question is, um, maybe this is for you, uh, Ms. Arnold, based upon the language about tracking incidents, is that infer that we have not tracked incidents from the past? I think it inf what it means is that we have not formally tracked incidents in the past. So we track all incidents, but we haven't, but we haven't tracked them in a way that, say, we track bullying incidents. So... Typically, I can speak for myself as a principal. I would have a binder set aside for bullying, one for um, all the documents related to consequences of other infractions, but for bullying, it, was just, it had its separate home. And so right now, the way we've been doing it with, with racist incidents or hate speech, hate crimes, um, I'm not sure if every, every principal is doing this, but they may be in that one uh, place with everything else. And it really deserves, that kind of tracking deserves to be on its own um, and, and probably in a fashion similar to the bullying, the protocol we follow for bullying. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think that, that this is very important. Uh, you can track um, obviously number of incidents, but also trends at, you know, maybe yes. a particular age groups and so on. So I think that yeah. the tracking that. portion is, is, is really pivotal in all this to see if, mm -hmm. if, if, you know, I don't know if there's maybe a particular focus that needs to be done at a, at a certain age level or something like that. So, sure. um, yep. but those are, those are, those are my questions. Again, I, I, I thank you for all your efforts in doing, I know it's not the easiest of work. I know it's a lot of coordination. Um, but I like what I see in, in the resolution. So, um, thank you for that. Uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Uh, I make a motion that the school committee vote to approve the anti-racism resolution as written. Motion by Ms. Limblom. Second. Second by Mr. Long. Uh, roll call vote. Gates, yes. Brandolini. Yes. Limblom. Yes. Long. Yes. The motion passes four to zero. Thank you again for all your hard work on that. Um, Moving forward, uh, second and final opportunity for public comments. If you have a question, please uh, raise your hand using the emoji. And I will ask you to unmute. Uh, Richard Taft. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, I'm Richard Taft. I'm on Brook Street. I have a student in Situate High School. Um, my comment is regarding <clears throat> my participation, the participation of a lot of other parents on the DEI committee. Um, I would have commented earlier, I just couldn't figure out the emoji. Um, uh, there were a number of parents that participated in the DEI. We put together a draft resolution and had asked at one point to have it placed on the shared drive <clears throat> for this committee. Um, it wasn't shared on the drive. It seems that every other group's information was shared. This is kind of a, you know, should have been really easy to share, but it wasn't. So, you know, we were left with just the feeling that, you know, uh, apparently different ideas, different viewpoints really weren't valued even though we had the same goal. I mean, the things that we changed in there were minor, uh, few words. We had the exact same uh, uh, goal, but the words were important. I agree that everyone felt the words were important. And the words really came down to where they were defined from. And the point here is, is that the words are defined as the people that drafted this resolution uh, drafted it uh, they're really defined from critical race theory. And that's different than how most people would understand these words. If you say to somebody, what does anti-racist mean? They don't know off the top of their head, they go to a dictionary. The dictionary will say opposed to racism and promoting racial tolerance. That's not how critical race theory advocates like Ibram Kendi, who's a highly um, recognized author in this topic and is used by the DEI to, as a reference book. That's not how critical race theory advocates define it. Basically, critical race theory advocates define everything in a very binary way. So for example, they'll say, and this is almost a direct quote, every policy in every institution in every community in every nation is producing or sustaining either racial inequity or equity. Either you're an anti-racist or a racist. That's some really binary, blunt language. Try to apply that to anything else and see if it really communicates what you want it to communicate. So, I mean, try, try, you're either an anti-New England Patriots fan or you're a Patriots fan. You're an anti-Democrat or a Democrat. You're an anti-bully or a bully. You're an anti-communist or you're an anti-white or a white. But this is the kind of language that critical race theory is built on. And there are other frameworks to build um, racial, um, racial harmony around. I did have a brief comment last time that, you know, liberalism is a construct and a general framework that allows you to address racism. And the differences between liberalism and critical race theory are, are pretty stark. So, I mean, if you said, you know, critical race theory believes that um, uh, uh, that um, everything is based on race, every interaction, whereas liberalism believes that liberty is the basis of interaction. Um, critical race theory believes that whiteness is a property, that only white people can, be ex can exclude other people from it. Um, liberalism believes that, in a, that equality is an inalienable right, which means you, you don't produce it. It's not a property that you develop. So, um, I mean, those things are really fundamental, but that kind of debate really wasn't asked for or allowed for. We, we were given some very specific things. We were broken down into committees, even though we all wanted to do the same thing. And so I agree, it was a hard group. It was 60 people, really hard to do the kind of consensus building or really listen to maybe a hard point of view, even though we all had the same goal. Um, and so, you know, I think that if the committee is moving forward, and it is, and if it's going to develop policies, procedures, books, and curriculum, it can't just base it on one theory. And um, that's, that's my comment. I think that's a comment of a lot of parents. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you for your comments. Much appreciated. Uh, you can. 
I'd like to speak to the, um, I'm not gonna talk about critical race theory because that was not part of the conversation in the DEI group. Um, we were looking at the resolution and we met as a committee and we brought, had um, breakout groups. And in those breakout groups, information was taken by the uh, facilitators and the information was then brought back to the advisory team um, under Jen Arnold. And the information was put together and that, that's how we came up with the resolution. Um, the document that you requested to be posted was not put together in, dur during the DEI committee. And that's why I felt it was not appropriate to be included. It was a document that was done outside of the constructs of the purpose of the DEI committee. So, and that was explained. Thank you. Any other uh, comments at this point? This is the last uh, point of the agenda for public comment. Um, Suzanne O'Brien, I'll ask you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Thank you. Um, I also participated on the subcommittee and wanted to thank everyone for their time. It was, it was a big learning experience. Um, and I just wanted to make this comment about the resolution that is presented. Um, I was struck by a quote I saw recently and it says, education is simply the soul of a society as it passes from one generation to another. That's by GK Chesterton. And I think the actions that we're taking, we need to ask ourselves, are they ones that ensure that the educational soul that we're giving our children in these public schools is one that celebrates and includes and provides a feeling of home and safety to every one of them, particularly those of marginalized groups. I feel that adopting this sort of resolution and specifically the resolution in front of us will put action steps and goals in place to allow our public schools to be successful in providing the sort of educational soul that we imagine um, that we want all of our children to receive. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just we, we did vote on the resolution, so it has been formalized. So thank you for supporting us. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments at this time? All right, seeing none, we will move on. Uh, acceptance of minutes. We have two uh, meetings from the uh, August 6th and August 10th. Any comments or questions? If not, I'll change a motion. I move to approve the August 6th, 2020 school committee minutes as presented. Motion by Mr. Long. Second. Second by Ms. Limblom. Uh, roll call vote. Gates, yes. Brandolini. Long. Yes. Brandolini. Uh, sorry, Limblom. Yes. <laughs> Motion passes four to zero. Uh, I need a motion on uh, August for August 10th minutes. Move to approve the August 10th, 2020 school committee minutes as presented. Motion by Mr. Long. Sorry. <coughs> Second. Second by Ms. Brandolini. Uh, roll call vote. Gates, yes. Limblom. Yes. Brandolini. Yes. Long. Yes. Motion passes four to zero. Um, moving on to correspondence, we all received the uh, mask mailing for the annual meeting. That's all being, I think that's all free and it is all via Zoom. So if you can participate, that would um, always have some good breakout rooms. Uh, other than that, moving on to warrants. Nothing, Dr. Dutch. There are no warrants tonight. All right. Uh, any other business? Yes, Ms. Limlong. I'd just like to uh, comment on the um, back to school night for uh, the high school and for Gates that I was uh, lucky enough to participate in both. And I just wanna say that both were very well run. Um, super easy to join the Zoom groups for all the teachers. And it was great that they you know, presented what their day looks like for the kids and what the expectation is for the kids at home. It was very helpful. Uh, it was a lot easier than trying to find the kids' classroom. <laughs> and no, no um, 
Lori's on parking, so that was a bonus too. <laughs> so, but it was great. It was, um, it, it, it was, I think it was very well done. And, you know, I just wanted to give a sailor shout out to the, <laughs> to the, the administrative teams for both schools. Thank you. I would echo that as well. Uh, anything else? If not, uh, future agenda items. Our next meeting is November 2nd. Um, there is a scheduling conflict, so we will not be in the uh, Center for Performing Arts. We'll be back to our, uh, most likely our room at the uh, Gate School. Um, we're anticipating having our first uh, student learning celebration at that next meeting. Um, and an update on October 1st enrollments. Uh, anything else by the committee? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn at 7.32. So moved. Move by Mr. Long. Second. Second by Ms. Lynn Long. Roll call vote. Gates, yes. Brandolini. Yes. Long. Yes. Lynn Long. Yes. Meeting is adjourned, 7.32. Thank you.